really a progression in all the nasty stuff you can do with JavaScript. And there are some great guys doing work in this field, you know, Jeremiah and Arsnake and PDP. Um, and we see all of these things progressing, right? We started with, you can port scan. And then we got to, okay, we found hosts, but now you can fingerprint them and find out what they're running. And then the next logical step that I took in uh, March was, okay, well, if we're fingerprinting them, we can find vulnerabilities on them too. So I wrote Jikto. And then the next logical step is, well, if we're finding vulnerabilities, we can write exploit tools in JavaScript too, which is what Dominatrix is. Uh, it only exploits verbose SQL injection. Uh, and it only works on SQL Server, but I mean, this stuff's trivial. I mean, the logic of how SQL injection works, the nuances of whether you're doing a cast or convert, whether you're talking to, you know, sys objects or SQLite master, you know, it, it just depends on the database. So the, the base work's done, and like I said, trivial to expand it. Um, no, we're not going to share the code with you, and no more foreplay, sugar, it's demo time. So, actually, I have this over here. Yeah, it's up. So glad I right. didn't set a timeout on that thing. Yeah, me too. <laughs> All right. So we're just running this against local hosts, but again, using the cross-domain web proxy or anything else, you're fine. I'm going to throw up Firebug, which I absolutely love. And please, Microsoft, for the love of God, make this work with your product. Um, <laughs> So this is, will be great because it's going to show us all the AJAX requests it's making in the background. And again, we would just be bouncing this through a web proxy like Google Translate to do this cross-domain. It's really trivial. So we actually run, you know, submit, and we see it start banging away. And all of these are, you know, it's doing selects and cast, select and cast. So this is it actually extracting the data. Now we've got a site called Pugnose, which is just this trivial movie site. It's still going. 13 seconds, 15 seconds. So it's grabbing all of these things out, um, dumping the table. And so first thing we did was dump sips. Ah, there we go. I probably should have run through a proxy. Well, you guys can actually see this. It's in the query string, though, so I'd have to do it. So that one, we did a tick or just to see if we get an ODBC error message. And if we actually look at the response, which was a 500, which is a pretty good indicator that we got one. Yeah, ODBC error, unclosed quotation mark, which is quite possibly my favorite error besides seeing an alert box that says XSS. And so we now know that it's SQL injectable. So um, we move along, especially when the XSS is in a bank. So obviously we just proceeded to dump this stuff. And if we look, I mean, anybody who's used a SQL injector, this should be very familiar to you. Um, there were nine tables. So for table TBL categories, there were only two columns in one row because this bookstore, actually, I'll just show you the bookstore. as it pulls up. So this is our little training site, and it just sells some DVDs. You know, you've got Hackers, which is a horrible movie. You have Sneakers, which is a phenomenal movie. And we're just exploiting this. I mean, you have to, you know, hand wave and say, OK, this is running one of those, you know, versions that we, you know, pulled from Sakunia that said this shopping cart software is vulnerable to SQL injection or what have you. And so this is actually where we're attacking. And so we're actually, you know, doing your, you know, union or and union select type stuff. Uh, and casts actually dump everything out. And so if we go back to Dominatrix, we see that you know, it's just dumping all these things out. There actually weren't any credit cards because I reset the database. There are three customers. Um, these tabs don't really line it up, but we see customer address, billing address, you know, nulls, some you know, fictitious or fictional realms, billy at bank.com. You know, billy Banks, let me, wow. My, billy Banks man. apparently has a password that is let me in. <laughs> I need to make this site a little more realistic. So we, we, dumped, we dumped all nine tables. We see some fun stuff. So I mean, again, this, this shouldn't be a shock to you. If, you. if this is the first time you were seeing SQL injection, I feel really sorry for you because you probably haven't understood a single thing we have said the entire time up here. Um, so, but the interesting thing is, is that this is a SQL injector written in JavaScript. So we can show a little bit of this without actually showing all of it. And I. Again, I, uh, I, I, there's no URL that can appear for a long period of time where someone can snipe it like what happened before. <laughs> so, you know, we're just doing row counts with selects to actually count things out, Ex you know, extract from the response. We go ahead and actually use a regex to pull out from the uh, ODBC error message. Uh, we see here where we're actually building uh, the table. If we want to get the data statement, we pass in the table name, the column, the row number, and the where clause we want to give it and it just builds these attacks. I mean, this is pretty basic SQL injector stuff. Um, but like I said, the interesting part is it's written in JavaScript. So we have attack tools in JavaScript. 
Does anybody have any questions? No one has any questions. That's a little shocking. The mutation engine? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, can we give that one out? Uh, no, we can't do that. <laughs> we can tell you about it, certainly. How much time do we have left? 15? Oh, great. Okay, yeah, well, we can, we can slow it down a little bit, because I know I've been talking a mile a minute, and uh, kind of talk about that a little. Let's check what's left, just to make sure that we don't oh, okay. like, lose anything. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, so we had, like, 40 slides. Yeah, we're pretty good. Ah, so possible right. defense. We can talk about, we'll show you the implementation in a moment, but let's talk about some of the possible defense that we could have for this thing, right? Because we're, we're talking about source code mutation and not being able to signature it, and that's kind of scary. So I would like to try to help people try to stop these things. Anybody here a computer science major? I'm sure there are a lot of you. You've probably heard of McCabe complexity diagrams. McCabe complexity diagrams basically are saying, look, we don't care what the syntax is. This is how nested the code is. If you're actually looking over here, I can't do it for both, so there are more people sitting over here, sorry. If you look at this, right, this right here is a loop. And inside the loop, there's an if statement, and it can go to this code block or this code block. There's a little bit of code after that if then else, or if else, and then it comes back and the loop repeats. There you've got an, uh, an if without an else clause because it comes back. And so this basically shows you how nested the code is, how complex the code is. And there's actually rules about if you have, you count the number of closed loops, and that's your overall complexity. Like this has a complexity of two. But this, this is a distinct fingerprint of the functionality of the code. So this basically says, look, I, like when I'm looking at this, I have no idea whether this is a while loop, a do while loop, a for loop, whatever it is. But I know that there's, a, there's some type of loop followed by some type of conditional code followed by a um, going back to here. So even if this if else got replaced by like a wow and a wow that had a break and the conditionals were set, I would still see this same type of code. So if you mutate the syntax of the source code, you're not changing the functionality of the code. And since a McCabe complexity diagram maps the functionality of the code, it's always going to be the same. So I can mutate the hell out of a factorial, or I can mutate the hell out of dominatrix, and it's going to have the same complexity diagram. But this is neat, but it's also not going to work in all cases because there's so many. Uh, it's kind of like, uh, uh, like for a hash that, you know, it could be 32 bytes, but we've seen a lot of hash collisions. Right. This is, it's based, you know, like, like the number of bytes you have is pretty much the number of statements that you right. have. I mean, let's ignore, yeah. ignore this top part because it's kind of chopped. Just go from seven down over here. You're, you're basically dealing with, I mean, there's something that had an if without an else, an if without an else, a f some type of loop with an if else inside. That probably describes a lot of programs. So it's, it's a fingerprint of functionality, but there are going to be a lot of things that have the same functionality in terms of their control structure. So we probably need to do more work on these. We're trying to figure this out, but we totally acknowledge that we're not necessarily the smartest of people, especially when you start getting into this really complicated stuff, because I slept through half a theory. <laughs> so you know, we're working on it, but please feel free to come talk to us. We think this probably has pretty good potential to actually detect source code mutation, because you can't alter the underlying functionality. Um, but by all means, please come and talk to us. We will gladly give you our research on this. In fact, we should probably just put together a white paper and publish it. Sounds In fact, actually, we did. I guess it's on your CD. <laughs> <laughs> so, so another possible thing here, right, is you can look at the traffic that's generated. And this certainly isn't unique to web worms, right? You can do this to any type of worm, you know, but not the content, because we're mutating the attacks, we're mutating the search strings. But if you're looking at something and it's like, all right, here's a Google query, and it was followed by these multiple types of HTTP requests, you know, it's, it's just traffic class, it's classic traffic analysis. But then it's also weird when, like, it's not done right where, where like, you might infect a server, and it mm -hmm. didn't write out to the page to get a client to, to exploit the next point. So why, why is a server that, that runs, like, Sun, why, why is that now viewing with Firefox a page? Right. Ch chances are it's not going to if it's got Solaris on it. Or why is MySpace.com, the server on MySpace.com, using you know, what looks like the user agent for wget to contact Wachovia.com? That's really weird. There's no reason a web server should contact that other web server. It might happen with like a web service, but you... Yeah, or a mashup. Yeah, like it's, it, it, it's known at that point. 
Right, so. you designed the app. You, you should know what other web servers your web server is talking to because it's either going to be talking to some type of you know, open API or other servers you control, a database tier, something like that. So any type of traffic that isn't supposed to be there should be pretty obvious. And you can check the functionality of a browser in some cases, but it's so odd from, from version to version. It, it, it doesn't always work properly because most people that take like uh, Perl or something like that and, and try and fake a browser can't fake the actual functionality of the browser and, and how it processes things. Everyone who thinks so. that writing a web scanner is easy, you should talk to me, talk to that man right there, God. to the guy next to him. It, yeah, you can, you can write <laughs> uh, a breadth first search crawler in six lines of Perl, but when you start dealing with session state and flash, you can talk to me. Um, Tra you can also look at the traffic that the payload generates, right? Scans, port scans, fingerprinting, all of this stuff is very loud. Um, and so the, the only downside to this defense is that it's all reactive. You're using this to identify hosts that have already been owned, um, which is not ideal. At least you're detecting that you're getting screwed, right? Because we're mutating the source. So you're seeing the source travel, and that's not getting flagged. But Based on kind of, it's like seeing the shadow of something without actually seeing the something. Which is good and bad, but that sounded very surreal. But I've been drinking a lot of Red Bull. So yeah, yeah. Who knows? But, yeah, like you've got so many clients though that can do all the infections. So you're kind of jumping from client to client to check. Okay, this guy's infecting me. Wait, no, this guy's infecting me. And it, it, it's jumping all over the place. So while it's loud, it's going to be really hard to to trace that and to, to actually have a trail. Exactly. So, I mean, kind of to sum all this up, it ultimately comes down to having secure web apps, right? Because all of these things are, are being able to propagate because of cross-site scripting, SQL injection that I can get to a store procedure for command execution, um, you know, uh, file uploading, um, you know, command execution vulnerabilities, different things like that. Um, you know, file injection, PHP injection, different things like this. So if your web app's secure, there's nothing for it to feed on. It can't propagate anywhere. Um, the, that's true of like a corporate architecture too. Like for mm -hmm. for stuff that, that's going to be for for all intents and purposes a, a, a critical app, you probably want to use client side search. You want to block it off so that it's not the same browser that's going MySpace. Because if if one browser can see MySpace and it can see like an internal thing for a hedge fund that's got all of the models in it, well, that's probably not good. It's got a shared resource that MySpace can now see the models inside of an hedge fund. It's getting frightening, right? But yeah. because I can basically, once I get your browser, your browser is now acting as a proxy and sending the request that I tell it to, air gaps are a pretty good looking solution. I'm sure that you don't have to go to that extreme, but it, it works for the government. <laughs> and they seem to like that a lot, even though they probably are spending lots of taxpayers' dollars to give everyone two machines connected to, you know, SpiderNet and yeah, well, not. Like one gets a rate of A and the other gets like a rate of F. So, <laughs> <laughs> good point. Yeah. So, obviously, the number one rule of web application security is don't trust the client. You cannot trust the client. Why are you people still trusting the client? We've been telling you this for 10 years. Um, everything can be modified. Uh, you know, hidden HTML input parameters, cookies, you all should know this by now. Um, obviously, you also should know never use anything for the client without sanitizing it. And there's still really bad advice about sanitizing, um, not from the web security, but from developer resources, you know, that people are talking about Ajax. In fact, I'll just go ahead and call them out. So there was a book, I'm writing a book on Ajax, but there was a book that came out pretty recently on Ajax, and there aren't a lot of them, so you'll all be able to figure it out. This is a book on web security, and they don't even use, they have input validation constitutes a paragraph. The first part, uh, actually two paragraphs. The first paragraph is on blacklisting, which apparently this person has never heard the term blacklisting because they call it like, like negative tamper or something like that. I don't know. He was, it didn't even make sense. And he said, so, you know, if you, you obviously shouldn't see single tick or greater than sign, less than sign. If you see those, the input is bad. That's blacklisting. That's saying, I'm seeing something that's bad, so I'll reject it. He then proceeds to say, the thing you should do is positive.